Thank you, Nick. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Jill to present this paper with David Zaki and uh, Tom will be the discussion. Okay, great. So uh, thanks to the organizers for putting our paper on the program and uh, really for a fun and interesting conference over the last two days. So a large literature has documented substantial differences in firm cyclicality or exposure to aggregate shocks. And more recent work has shown that this can have important implications uh, for the allocation of capital and for measures of aggregate productivity. In particular, when firms differ in their cyclicality, you know, investment decisions depend or are determined by kind of a standard asset pricing equation, which relates the expected rate of return on capital or the marginal product, you know, to a firm specific risk premium, which is the standard negative covariance of the return with the stochastic discount factor. Now in this paper, we're gonna ask what I think are really natural and important questions for this line of work, which are, what are the implications first for macroeconomic dynamics? And second, for the effects and really optimal conduct of stabilization policy, okay? So just to give you kind of a flavor of exactly the type of heterogeneity we have in mind, what I'm showing you in this slide is really a simple exercise where we took the set of firms in CompuStat. For each firm, we do a time series regression of its sales growth and aggregate GDP growth. And in the two pictures, I'm just plotting the coefficients from those regressions, okay? So on the left-hand side, we can see that there's a large amount of dispersion in these coefficients. So firms have very different sensitivities to business cycle shocks. And although the exact level of aggregation won't matter too much for today, in the right-hand panel, what I'm doing is I'm showing you only the component of this dispersion that comes across firms within industry. And we can see that that actually accounts for about two thirds of the total, okay? So kind of motivated by these patterns, we develop a general equilibrium business cycle model of heterogeneous firms that differ in their cyclicality. Okay, we're gonna use the model first to study the implications for macro dynamics. And in particular, we uncover what I think is a novel two-way feedback loop between aggregate TFP and the micro allocation, which implies that these are both equilibrium objects that are determined jointly. Okay. Second, we'll show that that points to a new role for monetary policy. And in particular, monetary policy is gonna affect the degree of aggregate risk. It's gonna influence the micro level resource allocation and that's gonna show up in the dynamics of TFP itself. Okay. So for most of the talk today, I'm gonna to lay out the model and I'm really gonna focus on the new sort of positive and normative implications for monetary policy. Okay, and at the end, I'll show you a very simple quantitative exercise where we try to put some numbers on how large the welfare gains from policy could be in this type of environment. And just as interesting, I think, uh, how large the potential losses might be when the central bank ignores heterogeneity. In other words, when the central bank sets policy as if it was living in a representative firm world, but the world is really a heterogeneous firm world. Okay. Good. So jumping right to the model. So the framework at its core is essentially gonna be like a textbook, small scale New Keynesian model uh, with two twists that I'll talk about in a minute. So the household side of the model is completely standard. Households have CRA preferences over consumption and labor. This gives us the usual stochastic discount factor. Okay, households supply labor to firms, but they face uh, wage setting frictions in the form of quadratic adjustment costs. So wages are sticky. Households supply capital to firms. And we're gonna assume that the aggregate capital stock is always gonna be fixed. Okay, and this is a standard assumption in the New Keynesian literature. And for us, it's really gonna have the feature that it lets us hone in on the new aspects of the model, which is gonna be, you know, given this fixed pie of capital, how do we allocate it across all these different firms? Okay. Uh, the final good is produced by a competitive representative firm, which bundles intermediates, and all the action is gonna happen in these intermediate good firms. Okay, so there's a continuum of these intermediate firms, and importantly, they differ in their productivity, which I call here AIT. And in particular, uh, productivity at the firm level is gonna be, be determined by an aggregate shock, AT. And what I'm showing in this first equation here is that every firm is gonna have a different sensitivity or loading on that aggregate shock. And by the way, lowercase denote natural logs, and that's gonna be the case throughout the paper. So each firm has a different beta I, and it should be clear that these beta I's are gonna, really gonna capture the cyclicality of these firms. So high beta firms are gonna be extremely pro-cyclical, low beta firms are gonna be less pro-cyclical. Okay. Now I'm gonna assume for simplicity for now that the aggregate shock is IID with a variant sigma squared epsilon, but I'll relax that later for the quantitative work, that won't make a big difference. 
And in the cross section, I'm gonna assume that these betas are normally distributed with a mean of one and a cross sectional variance sigma squared beta. And that's gonna be kind of an important parameter. <laughs> Okay, so that's kind of our first departure from a textbook kind of New Keynesian model. Okay, labor is chosen frictionlessly, which is going to give us a standard labor demand at the firm level. And investment is almost chosen in the standard way. Firms choose capital one period, one period, excuse me, in advance to maximize expected discounted profits minus the cost of capital. But in our second kind of twist on the New Keynesian model, we assume that firms actually use a distorted version of the household stochastic discount factor when they're discounting future profits. Okay, so this term in blue, T lambda T, is gonna capture like a distortion or a wedge to the household, to the firm stochastic discount factor, excuse me. Okay. For now, I'm gonna assume that the wedge is completely exogenous. It's gonna be a constant elasticity function of the aggregate shock. Uh, so this tau lambda T is log of the distortion. And we can see that the cyclicality of the distortion is gonna be governed by this negative tau lambda A. Okay, so again, this is going to be completely exogenous for now, but in the paper we provide two micro foundations that lead to a distortion of exactly this type. The first is kind of based on limited household um, participation in asset markets along the lines of recent two agent New Keynesian models, and the second is based on the presence of financial intermediaries who face frictions in the form of collateral constraints. Okay. So just to be clear, the sign convention on the wedge here means that when tau lambda A is positive, the wedge is gonna be counter cyclical. In other words, the wedge is gonna fall in good times and that's gonna augment movements in the discount factor. And it's gonna make firms look inefficiently averse to bearing risk relative sort of to what preferences and aggregate dynamics would dictate. Would dictate excuse me. Okay, now we don't impose the sign of tau lambda A, but in the empirical work, we're gonna find it's positive. And I'll talk a little bit about why when I get to the calibration. So in the back of your mind, I want you to think that this tau lambda A is positive. Okay, agents are inefficiently averse to bearing risk in this model. So in a first result, we can show that despite kind of the rich heterogeneity, we can aggregate this economy and show that it's from the macro perspective, it's observationally equivalent to a representative firm economy, but where TFP is endogenous. Okay, so in the first equation here, I'm showing that the model admits a standard aggregate production function with this TFP term psi t in blue. In the second equation, I'm showing that TFP is just an average of all the firm level productivities weighted by their shares of the capital stock. Okay, and the third equation, which is really where all the economics happens, shows what determines firm share of the capital stock. Well, it's a standard first order condition from the firm's investment problem, where firms equate the expected discounted marginal product of capital, you know, to the user cost of capital. Okay, of course, they're using this distorted stochastic discount factor. From here, the rest of the uh, equilibrium dynamics of the model are exactly in the standard New Keynesian model. In the first equation, I'm showing a particular representation of output. So output here is the sum of two terms. The first term is driven by fluctuations in TFP, psi t. And I'm gonna kind of, in some abusive terminology, and I think Tom is gonna talk about this more in his discussion, I'm gonna call this a natural rate of output. It would look that way, at least to a macroeconometrician, because it looks like it's purely driven by TFP. Okay, the second term here is the output gap, which comes directly from the sticky wages, okay, in the standard way. Uh, the second equation is the New Keynesian Phillips curve, just relating the output gap to inflation. And the last equation here is the standard consumption Euler equation. Okay, and finally, I have to take a stand on how monetary policy operates here. And it turns out to be convenient to assume that monetary policy directly sets the cyclicality of the output gap. Okay, so monetary policy is gonna choose a, a value for this mu A, and mu A is governing how the output gap is related to the exogenous shock AT. Okay, but in the paper, we show that you can implement this with a nominal interest rate rule, meaning the nominal interest rate has a cyclicality IA, where IA has the opposite sign of mu A. Okay, so when I say counter cyclical policy, what I mean is a negative mu A, meaning that the central bank smooths by pushing output below the natural rate in expansions, above the natural rate in recessions, uh, and that corresponds to a more pro-cyclical nominal interest rate. Good. So the first thing we're gonna do here is try and characterize the microallocation. Okay, and then next I'm gonna build back up to characterize aggregate TFP. But to do this, we're gonna use the fact that in equilibrium, TFP is gonna take the following form. So it's an affine function of the exogenous shock AT. Okay, it has an endogenous constant level term, what I'll call psi bar, 
and it's got a loading on AT, what I'll call Psi A. And I'm gonna show you in the next slide that both these terms, Psi bar and Psi A, depend on the allocation of capital at the micro level. So across all the heterogeneous firms. And so in order to characterize those terms, I first have to understand what the allocation looks like. Okay, so I'm gonna do this in two steps. First, I can derive a standard Euler equation or asset pricing equation which relates the expected marginal product of capital at the firm level to a constant plus a risk premium, which is just the standard negative covariance of the MPK with the stochastic discount factor. Now, remember, this is exactly the equation I showed you on the first slide in the introduction. So here it pops right out. Okay, and it turns out in the simple setting, we can derive a sharp expression for the risk premium, this covariance term, which depends of course on the firm's beta. It depends on the volatility of aggregate shocks. And it depends on this term kappa, which I'll call like a risk adjustment in the allocation. And kappa is gonna turn out to be a sufficient statistic for capturing all the different sources of aggregate risk in the model, okay? What I'm showing you in this last line here is that kappa is composed of three sources. There's three sources of aggregate risk. There's risk over TFP. So that's captured by this psi A. This kappa psi is some complicated constant, but it's increasing in risk aversion just to give you some intuition. Okay, the risk wedge directly leads to aggregate risk and movements in the output gap also lead to aggregate risk, where again, kappa L is some complicated positive constant. Okay. So turning back to my middle equations, we can see two key effects of aggregate risk on the allocation. First, when there's aggregate risk, when kappa is positive, high beta firms have to offer a higher marginal product of capital. And that's basically compensation to investors for bearing aggregate risk. Okay, at the same time, when beta, uh, excuse me, when kappa is positive, high beta firms choose a lower level of capital, okay? And so aggregate risk causes a shifting of capital from high beta to low beta firms. And just note that these two effects are really two sides of the same coin, right? High beta firms have to offer higher marginal products of capital because of decreasing returns in the production function. The way that they do that is by choosing a lower level of capital. So what's the role of monetary policy? Well, monetary policy is directly gonna choose this mu A so counter cyclical policy, meaning a smaller positive or negative mu A is gonna reduce aggregate risk, right? Macroeconomic fluctuations are gonna be smaller because the central bank is smoothing. That reduces kappa, okay? That's gonna, looking at my capital equation here, that's gonna cause a shifting of capital from actually from low to higher beta firms. Meaning when the central bank is reducing aggregate risk, the private sector is gonna react by taking on more risk, okay? And it's gonna move capital towards higher, riskier, higher beta firms. Okay, and at the same time, uh, it's gonna when the central bank is doing counter cyclical policy, it's gonna reduce kappa. That's gonna reduce the risk adjustment in the marginal product of capital. And what I'm showing in this final equation on the slide, here I've taken the cross-sectional dispersion in the marginal product of capital. It's strictly increasing in kappa. And so essentially when the central bank is reducing the amount of aggregate risk, it's reducing kappa. It's also gonna reduce the amount of marginal product dispersion that's out there. And I'm going to show you in a minute, that's going to be important for measures of TFP. Okay. And so I think the key takeaway of the slide is there's really these two key effects of monetary policy on micro level allocations. Uh, there's the risk taking channel and there's the marginal product dispersion channel. Good. So turning back to TFP, given those micro level results, I can actually aggregate all those firm level investment decisions. And I can solve explicitly for my two terms, psi bar and psi A, as functions of this uh, risk adjustment term kappa. Okay, so looking first at psi A, we can see, which is the loading of endogenous TFP on the exogenous shock, we can see that it equals one minus a term that depends on kappa, and of course depends on the extent of heterogeneity. So what's happening there? When, the, when there's more aggregate risk, when kappa is high, we already saw that capital is moving to low beta, less cyclical firms. And that nat naturally makes TFP itself less cyclical, okay? At the same time, uh, we can go to Psi bar and we see that when Kappa is high, Psi bar is gonna be low, okay? And in fact, Psi bar is just proportional to the cross-sectional dispersion in expected marginal products that I showed you on the last slide, okay? So we have these two key effects of risk on aggregate TFP. When there's a lot of aggregate risk, when Kappa is high, a TFP itself becomes less volatile and the level of TFP in the long run is, is also gonna fall, okay? And I should note here that the result is more general. Here, we're just looking at monetary policy, but any forces that enter kappa are gonna have these effects on the cross-sectional allocation and on aggregate TFP, okay? So again, what's the role of monetary policy? So think about counter-cyclical policy. 
meaning a smaller or more negative mu A, it's gonna cause kappa to fall. That causes capital to shift to high beta firms. TFP itself is gonna become more volatile. Psi A is gonna go up. At the same time, the long run level of TFP is gonna increase. Psi bar is gonna go up. Okay, so we have this level effect and this volatility effect and they move in the same direction. And to me, actually, what's really interesting here is the level effect, because it says that even in this model with a standard formulation of nominal rigidities, monetary policy has permanent effects. So monetary policy is not neutral in the long run, and that's because it's affecting the allocation of resources across firms, which sort of pushes the economy either closer to or further from its production possibilities frontier. Okay, and there's a second implication, by the way, which says that you know, the effects of monetary policy on the allocation really changes the effectiveness of stabilization. So the way I'm showing that here is I derive an expression for the uh, volatility of output. It depends on what looks like the natural rate or movements in TFP, and it depends on the output gap. So in most models, we think this term is exogenous. And so changes in the output gap translate one-to-one -one into changes in the volatility of output. In this model, as the central bank smooths the output gap, it actually increases the volatility of TFP, which moves in the other direction. Okay, so it offsets some of the effect of the policy. And what's going on here is what I think is a type of Lucas critique that says, you know, we typically think about TFP as being exogenous when we're setting monetary policy, but in this, in this framework, it's not the case. And in fact, volatility of TFP moves in the opposite way as the uh, stabilization policy itself. Good, so that's basically summing up the positive effects of policy, both on the micro allocation and on uh, aggregate TFP. Okay, so turn to sort of the normative uh, implications of the model, we can derive here a representation for the social welfare function. You know, it's the sum of four terms. The first two terms, the last two terms, excuse me, are exactly standard. This is the volatility of inflation. This is the volatility of the output gap. The first two terms are what, what are new. This is the level of TFP, and this is the volatility of TFP. And I should clarify, these terms are always there in the New Keynesian model. It's just that we typically think the first two are exogenous, and so we can discard them when we think about policy. Whereas in our framework, they're of course endogenous and all depend on the choices of the central bank, which are inside of mu t. Okay, so from there, we can actually derive a sharp representation of the optimal policy. Okay, so this is the optimal cyclicality of the output gap. It's a negative function of the distortion and the discount factor tau lambda and depends on the amount of heterogeneity in the economy sigma squared beta. So just to go through some special cases, we can clearly see when there's no distortion, when tau lambda A is zero, you wanna set the cyclicality of the output gap to zero. Okay, in other words, when there's no distortion, the laissez-faire flexible price allocation of capital is efficient. The only distortion in the economy is coming from the sticky wages. We know that the central bank can fix that by completely stabilizing inflation in the output gap, and that's exactly what it would do. So in other words, there's a version of the divine coincidence that, that's gonna hold here. Okay, in contrast, when the risk wedge is counter cyclical, meaning agents are inefficiently averse to bearing risk, it means the laissez-faire level of the capital allocation is too conservative. Okay, the central bank can help rectify that by making the uh, output gap more counter cyclical, meaning it's gonna reduce the amount of aggregate risk and incentivize more risk taking on the part of the private sector, which makes the allocation closer to the one that maximizes production. Okay, and the presence of sigma squared beta here says that when there's more heterogeneity and more um, opportunities for reallocation, any distortion in the allocation uh, is more costly. And so the central bank wants to do even more aggressive counter cyclical policy. Okay, and the last point I wanna make here is even though you can't see it on, from the equation, the central bank cannot restore the first best in this economy and it can't even put the allocation to first best. And the reason why is, of course, as it's driving the output gap to be more and more counter cyclical, you know, it's gonna start bearing more and more volatility and inflation in the output gap and those terms are costly on their own. Okay, so there's gonna be an okay. interior solution to the optimal policy. Do you hear one more minute? Uh, okay, so just turning, I'm probably two, but just turning to uh, the quantitative results, I can't go through the calibration, but what I'm showing you here is essentially the welfare losses and the cyclicality of policy under four different scenarios. Okay, so in the baseline scenario, I assume that monetary policy uh, follows a standard Taylor rule we can see that the welfare losses are fairly large. This is 1.8% of lifetime consumption in the steady state. But strikingly, the vast majority of those losses come from the level of TFP. And that term is not there in the standard New Keynesian setup. 
Okay. I'll skip column two, but going to column three, this is the optimal policy taking into account heterogeneity. And we can see what happens is first looking at the last column, this term here is the elasticity of the nominal interest rate to TFP. So I'm using that as a measure of how uh, counter cyclical policy is. And we can see that the optimal policy is much more counter cyclical than the Taylor rule. What that does is it increases the level of TFP. So the losses from the level of TFP are lower. At the same time, it increases the volatility of TFP. Okay, and you can see that there's some substantial welfare gains that can be had from optimal policy, a big chunk of which come from improving the level of TFP. In fact, optimal policy increases the level of TFP here by almost half of a percentage point. Okay, and then my last main result in column four, I show you what happens when the central bank sets policy, uh, ignoring heterogeneity. So the central bank here is thinking it's living in a representative firm world when it's really living in my heterogeneous firm world. Uh, we know exactly what the optimal policy looks like in that case. Uh, the central bank completely stabilizes inflation and the output gap. So these two terms are zero. Okay. You see that there's some welfare gains relative to the baseline. So about uh, uh, 0.4 percentage points, but the central bank is almost completely missing out on all of the gains that could have gotten from increasing the level of TFP. Okay. So you can see that actually when the central bank sets policy to the optimum, ignoring heterogeneity, uh, the losses from the level of TFP are slightly larger than just under a standard Taylor rule meaning the level of TFP is slightly lower in column four uh, than in column one. So kind of the takeaway from the slide, I know I had to rush it a little bit, is just that uh, the losses from the level of TFP in this framework can be large. Um, optimal policy can go some way towards rectifying that. Optimal policy being set ignoring heterogeneity kind of foregoes some substantial gains that we could have had. So just to wrap up, I showed you a theory connecting business cycle dynamics and resource allocations. It points to this new role for monetary policy. A simple quantitative exercise suggests those gains can be substantial. Um, in the paper, we have a bunch of additional results. I didn't have time to go over, but I would encourage anybody who's interested to read the paper. And of course, we're thinking about working on a bunch of things that are related to this in the uh, future. Uh, so thanks very much. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Tom, uh, can you share the slides? Yep. Yeah, Tom Wingrew will give us this lesson. Okay, so I'll start now. So thanks very much for, um, for asking me to discuss this paper. I learned a lot. I read this paper and also um, a previous paper by Joel, David, and, and Lucas Schmidt, who, which this paper builds on. And I think both are great. I, I learned a lot, so I appreciate the, the opportunity. Um, I thought I would start the discussion just by putting this paper in the context of the literature a little bit, the literature on optimal monetary policy. Of course, that literature builds on the textbook New Keynesian model. I think it might be useful to put down some notation. So I'll take the notation of that model from Gali. That model has, has two key equations, as I'm sure we all know. So the first is the New Keynesian Phillips curve. Inflation is, is related to the present value of marginal cost, which in recursive form says inflation is going to be related to this measure of marginal cost plus expected future inflation. And given the production structure of that model, marginal cost can be expressed in terms of this output gap, which is what the, in the log linearized form, what output is relative to the natural rate of output, what it would be if they're totally flexible. So that's the new Keynesian Phillips curve. And then the second equation is the IS curve, just basically the consumption Euler equation, plugging in that consumption is output, but again, written in gaps. So that relates the output gap to the minus of the EIS times the expected real rate relative to the natural real rate um, plus expected consumption or expected output gap in the next period. So kind of the first benchmark uh, of this literature was Joel alluded to a little. What happens if the natural rate of output, so what, what the economy produces when prices are flexible is efficient? Well, you can write the welfare losses that you get in the full model of sticky prices relative to the efficient model in terms of two objects. One is how far output from um, the natural rate. So what's going on with the output gap that kind of determines these distortions from, from time varying markups. And then the second is what are the losses from having uh, price dispersion, which is gonna be related to inflation. So the way you minimize these welfare losses is by eliminating the output gap and eliminating inflation and in this textbook model, you can, you can do that. If you just look at the new Keynesian Phillips curve, eliminating the output gap and eliminating inflation are consistent with each other. And then from the IS curve, you get that setting the, the nominal rate to the natural rate is, is how you, questions about how you implement that. But that, that basic prescription is called the divine coincidence. 
So that's not super interesting. Monetary policy doesn't really face a, you know, off between stabilizing output and inflation. The way you get that trade off is, is similar to what this paper does. Uh, assume that the natural rate of output is not efficient. So I'll call the efficient level YTE. In this case, you get a cost push shock in the, uh, in the New Keynesian Phillips curve. So if you just rewrite that Phillips curve, which again depends on output gap in terms of two gaps, so the welfare relevant one, what's output relative to this efficient level, plus what's the efficient level relative to the natural level, you get this equation here. And the welfare losses are again going to depend on how far is output from its efficient level, what's going on with price dispersion. And I sort of said before, there are some additional terms that are independent of policy. Okay. Now, unfortunately, kind of eliminating this, this, this welfare relevant output gap, setting X to zero and setting inflation to zero isn't feasible because you can't just set those two things to zero in the new Keynesian Phillips curve. You have this additional cost push shock term. So monetary policy faces a trade-off. It's going to have to trade off how much it wants to stabilize output relative to efficient level and inflation, where that trade-off is governed by these parameters of, of the model. OK, so with all that of back, as background, what does this paper do? Well, it's also going to assume that the natural rate of output is not efficient because of the risk wedge that Joel talked about. And in addition to that, it's going to endogenize one of these terms that's, that was previously um, independent of monetary policy the level of long run TFP. So as, as Joel described quite clearly, when monetary policy stabilizes output more, reduces the amount of aggregate risk in the economy, that's gonna reduce the dispersion of marginal products of capital across firms and lead to higher TFP. And so what that says is that, however, you in the cost push shock model, before, before this additional trade-off, however you felt about stabilizing output versus inflation, you should now wanna stabilize output even more. Or in other words, you should play, put less weight on stabilizing inflation because on the margin, stabilizing out additional benefit of, of raising TFP. Honestly. So that's what I that's kind of how I see the main contribution, the main contribution of the paper relative to this literature. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, I think that's a very interesting mechanism and, and a nice paper. So I wanted to make sure I said nice paper here in, in the slides. Um, so my first comment is one that to think about relating their, um, their results a little bit more to this literature, and it has to do with how you define the natural rate of output. Um, as Joel said, it's a little tricky how you do it. So they, did, they defined it in a particular way, which is not quite independent of policy, because policy affects the amount of risk in the economy, which affects TFP. And given their definition of, of natural output, that's not independent of monetary policy. Whereas the, in the baseline model that I wrote out here, the natural rate is independent of policy because it's whatever the economy produces when prices are flexible. And so that leads to the question that if you define the natural rate in this, what I'll call standard way, would you get back to a world where setting output equal to an efficient level, so setting X equal to zero, would that endogenously give you that TFP, the long run level of TFP is also efficient? I, I would conjecture, I think the answer to that is yes. If that's the case, then I think you could think about this paper in terms of, again, facing this trade-off between stabilizing output relative to its efficient level and stabilizing inflation, placing an additional weight here on the X term, which is related to all of these interesting mechanisms Joel talked about in terms of, of allocation. Um, so I, I think that would be just a kind of useful way to relate the, the paper to the literature. Of relating the paper to the literature, this literature runs into all kinds of problems with how monetary policy you know, affects expected future inflation, you know, discretionary discretion versus commitment, the time inconsistency of, of policy under commitment because of initial conditions, all of that stuff, which might be useful to discuss uh, in the paper as well. I think what the paper does now is kind of assume policy can commit to this uh, kind of timeless perspective, but there may be something interesting there. So that's just more of an aside for, for Joel and David on, on what they could how more they could relate to this literature. Okay, so hopefully I've kind of communicated one of the key um, mechanisms behind their results is that the natural rate of output is not efficient. So let's think about that a little bit more um, and where that comes from. And I'll do this in a very simple version of the model. I'll go quite quickly because Joel explained it very well. So there are a bunch of which produce output YIT where output depends on their TFP and their capital stock, which they choose in, in the previous period. 
So then aggregate output, just summing output across firms I is this expression here on the slide. You can then multiply and divide by the aggregate capital stock raised to alpha to get the aggregate output is you know, the aggregate capital stock times this endogenous TFP term. That depends on the, the covariance of TFP with how much capital firms have. Because of decreasing returns, you want higher TFP firms to have more capital. What the planner would like firms to do, what would result in the efficient allocation is firms should choose their capital discounting their future returns on capital using the household's marginal rate of substitution. So the cost of capital is just this rental rate RT minus one, capital is chosen in T minus one for use in T. And so they discount at this, at the marginal rate of substitution. And what you get is the capital stock that firm's gonna choose. This has a, a, a closed form expression is just gonna be related to how the firm would discount the future productivity in the risk neutral world plus this covariance of the discount factor with the firm's own productivity. Firms that are more cyclical, have a higher beta, are gonna have a more negative value of this covariance and are gonna choose a lower value of their capital stock. Now that's gonna create dispersion in marginal products across the firms have high capital and high beta firms have uh, low capital, but that dispersion is efficient. Okay? So, so that dispersion means that aggregate TFP is gonna be less than one because Again, there are decreasing returns. You want all firms to have equal amounts of capital or equalized marginal products, I should say. So that dispersion is gonna create TFP losses, but it's efficient. So the reason that equilibrium is gonna be inefficient relative to that benchmark is that firms are discounting, not using the household's marginal rate of substitution, but this twisted or this, uh, this additional or this different discount factor, lambda tilde, which has this additional risk wedge tau lambda t. And that has the effect of essentially blowing up the, the kind of the variance of the discount factor relative to what households want, which then blows up the dispersion in capital stocks chosen by firms, blows up the dispersion in marginal products, and makes TFP inefficiently low. So very clear about that one. So that's the source of the inefficiency. And I'll want to think more about that in a second. How does monetary policy kind of address this inefficiency? How can it improve on this? Well, in the full model, what the covariance is not, that's going to matter is not just the covariance of this with TFP, but the covariance with some measure of aggregate demand, which determines the returns on capital that firms get when they're investing. If that covariance is, is not aligned with the planner, then what the monetary authority can do is change the variance of aggregate demand, lower aggregate risk, lower that covariance, and therefore decrease the dispersion in marginal products across firms, raising aggregate TFP and bringing it closer to what what the planner would like them to do. That's kind of the key inefficiency driving all of their results is there's this wedge between how households discount the future and how firms discount the future. And really all monetary policy can do to address that is by changing the amount of aggregate risk in the economy. So kind of the second comment or a set of comments I had when reading this paper is, you know, what is this wedge? And in particular, do we think it's invariant to policy or could monetary policy potentially have independent effects on this risk wedge T lambda, which could be interesting to explore. Uh, as Joel said, so the paper has two kind of micro foundations of the wedge, both of which I think are interesting to think about and maybe push more because both of which kind of suggest that monetary policy may have, may be able to have an independent influence on the wedge. So the first of these possible explanations is, is limited stock market participation. So firms are owned only by a subset of households in the economy. Um, they, therefore, they discount with those households uh, discount factor. And those households are going to be uh, wealthier than the other households who don't own firms because the households who own the firms get the firm's profits. And the wedge that, that T lambda that enters the, um, the lambda tilde object here is going to be related to the gap in consumption between the firm owners and non-owners. Or in other words, it's going to be related to the profit share in the economy. And then if that profit share is pro-cyclical, that's going to make that wedge pro-cyclical which is what, as Joel said, you need to get your get the results. The second possible explanation uh, is there's frictions in the financial intermediation sector. So the cost of capital that firms face, uh, it depends on the willingness of banks to lend to them. If there's some friction in that process, then the you know that cost of capital is going to depend on the willingness of banks to lend, which is in simple models related to bank net worth. And again, if bank net worth is pro-cyclical, you get this additional volatility in the wedge. So both of those make complete sense. The only part of this comment is to think about, well, maybe monetary policy will have independent effects on the wedge 
in this situation, meaning that there's more that monetary policy can do rather than just lower volatility of aggregate demand to address this inefficiency. And that might have additional kind of interesting implications. In terms of the first kind of explanation uh, that the wedge comes from profits, well, monetary policy, expansionary policy is gonna reduce markups and therefore reduce profits. And they in, therefore through that channel kind of independently reduce the wedge or thinking about the intermediation frictions, maybe monetary policy raises bank net worth um, and, and through, that, through that channel would reduce the wedge as well. So I think that might be interesting to think about how that endogeneity would affect the incentives of the, of the monetary authority for stabilizing output, but also because it may suggest other policy instruments that would be better suited for addressing this, this misallocation of capital, something like regulating banks, for example, or some sort of fiscal policy in a limited participation world. Um, okay, so that, those are just on the kind of the theory side. Um, in terms of the quantification of the model, I have some kind of smaller comments on the quantification. I thought, it, you know, as Joel said, it was a, a nice way to kind of lay out the stakes of this channel for what monetary policy should be doing. So these comments are all just in the spirit of making sure those stakes are kind of in line with key testable implications uh, for the data. So I'll just quickly go through four of those that are worth thinking about. Um, the first is that the capital adjustment process in this model is fairly stylized. Most importantly, there are no adjustment costs, which means that capital demand is going to be, you know, extremely elastic. So you can compute the elasticity of capital demand to that rental rate in the expression I had, that's going to be one over one minus alpha, where alpha is that share of capital in production. And that share is really once you maximize out all of your variable inputs like labor, so if you think alpha is like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, that elasticity is like two and a half or three. Or in terms of flow investment, if you think about investing with a depreciation rate of something like 10% per year, that's gonna be an investment elasticity of, of something like 28. And so the question is, if capital is that demand elastic, is it also very elastic to heterogeneity and firm level beta uh, as well? And so given a distribution of, what does this imply for the distribution of capital stocks and margin? firms. I wonder if it's very dispersed relative to the data and therefore magnifying these, these kind of misallocative effects relative to the data. And so I think one, one nice thing that to do would just be to compare the dispersion in capital and marginal products in the model to the data, whether some sort of quantitative version of this with adjustment costs to bring down these, to bring down these price elasticities uh, may be worthwhile. So that's, that, that's one thing. Um, the second question I had, so I haven't had that much experience thinking about heterogeneity and firm level betas. That's one of the things I thought was kind of the most interesting I learned the most about. But I wonder, you know, the paper sensibly takes the distribution of these betas as exogenous, but presumably there's some underlying force that's under some sort of choice of the firm. So if they're thinking about which industries to enter into, some industries will be more cyclical than others, but there's probably some higher return in the more cyclical industries to, to compensate for that, or even within industry into different lines of businesses. So I wonder in the data how the firm level beta is correlated with other heterogeneity and firm level fundamentals, something like average productivity, if you have this return risk trade-off, or capital shares, or, or, or whatever. Just I, It might be useful to see how this beta heterogeneity correlates with other sources of heterogeneity, and whether the resulting allocation of capital would kind of work against this channel or work with this channel. Um, the, the third kind of quantitative comment is, is also about this risk wedge building on, on what I was thinking about in the last slide. So the risk wedge, as Joel said, is in elasticity, gonna be, log risk wedge, I should say, is an elasticity chosen to be 14.7 times aggregate TFP, the standard deviation of which is like 0.07. So the log volatility of this risk wedge is, is quite large. And I wonder if you take those uh, micro foundations in terms of profit shares or bank net, net worth seriously, it, does this, it, it, is this volatility sensible relative to the variance in, in profit shares or net worth? Um, or to take you know, the, way that they, the way that they calibrate this 14.7 number is to match something about asset pricing data where asset price risk is driven purely by TFP shocks where TFP shocks you know, are not the only source of risk in the economy. So I wonder to what extent, if other shocks are allowed to drive the risk premium, how that would affect this number. 
Um, so that was just, I don't have anything super concrete to say there. So maybe it's not a, a very useful comment, but it would be nice to see some testable implications um, of that. Last thing, and then I'll wrap up. This is a very minor, minor comment, but in terms of the policy implementation through the through the IS curve, the EIS is one over the, the coefficient of risk aversion given CRA preferences. So it's going to be one tenth, meaning that if monetary policy wants to increase aggregate percent, they got to cut real rates by, by 10%. So the ZLV must be a problem in this kind of calibration. Um, I mean, of course, I'm not suggesting putting the ZLV into this model, but just something simple like Epstein's in to decouple these things. That's a, that's a minor comment more about the implementation quantitatively in terms of how you map these policy, policy prescriptions for output gaps back into policy prescriptions for, for the nominal rate. Um, that's it. Okay, so that's all I got to say. Again, the, the, the main thing I hope you take away from the discussion is a very nice paper. I learned a lot uh, from it, and I thought this was a very interesting monetary policy trade-off. I just had some comments on how to relate that to the optimal policy, or how those kind of conclusions depend on the source of this risk, risk wedge, and application is, is kind of reasonable. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Tom, for the great discussion. Uh, now the floor is open. Um, just to speak up if you have questions. I have a minor question to, to Joe, mostly about the role of the stick wages. Why stick wages have stick prices? Is it something about the cyclicality of profits that you fix with this? Or is just to make the problem of the firm simpler and you can separate the heterogeneity from the, the wages? Yeah, it's really the latter. We just didn't want there to be some like mechanical uh, interaction between the, the, the nominal rigidities and sort of the new mechanism, which is the risk. So we mm -hmm. just decided to put them on like two opposite sides of the economy. But we actually worked out versions with sticky prices as well when we first started working on this. And you know, the results look kind of similar. Um, it's just a bit simpler this way, actually. Joel, can I ask like just, uh, sorry, this might be like a, a super elementary question and I'm sure I may have missed something. By the way, I, I like the paper a lot. I want to just understand one issue, which is I, I get the idea that if you had the magic wand and you could reduce the TFP dispersion from an exante perspective, it would make, especially, you know, if, if, if firms use a different STF, you'd want to do something to, to stabilize it. I get that. But if I went to an extreme where I said, suppose firms cannot adjust their capital, they're given some capital and they only make labor decisions. It's not immediately obvious to me that you want to reduce, if you have some magic wand that can reduce the dispersion of TFPs, that you'd want to do that because you'd want workers to travel to the most productive firms. If you increase the dispersion of TFP, you get more, you give the economy more of a chance to produce these very high TFPs and you get the workers to move there. So it's all like, it feels to me that I didn't hear you guys talk about it, this effect. There was a lot about the exante effect, which I'm, I'm you know, 100% with you on, but it seems there's this exposed effect, which is that the higher productivity dispersion makes labor travel to now productivities you didn't have to. Can you comment a little bit of that? I apologize. Yeah, so no, that's a great, that's a great question. question. So in these heterogeneous firm economies, typically you like there to be spread in TFP because of course, then you can direct resources to the higher TFP firms and that's kind of good. Um, here, that's all kind of independent of policy. Um, and so it doesn't really enter the trade-off that the central bank is facing. No, it can't really do anything about that, um, but that's going on in, in the background actually. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, what's really, what's really the cost of, um, what's really costly marginal product dispersion in this economy is the idea that you don't quite fully take advantage of doing that because of this, uh, because of this risk premium at the firm level. I think that was clear from the presentation. I think that that's, you know, it, but like there is something there that like I'd, I'd have to look a little bit more into the details where, as you said, you, you gave a very good answer. You said like, the, you know, you can't really do anything about it. So I want to understand a little bit better why you can do something about the example, you can't do something about the exposed. But yeah, this is my own confusion. I, I have a question about um, 
the time consistency of policy in this model, I'm wondering if it's the case that future commitments to boost the value of capital, you know, in bad states makes it, you know, less risky to invest in capital today pushes, you know, people to take more risk and whether that might be inconsistent with what you want to do for sticky wage stabilization reasons ex post. Right. So actually that's kind of what's going on in the model. I mean, when the, when the central bank, we're kind of looking at the timeless perspective, like Tom said, we're assuming throughout that the central bank can commit to this rule. And the rule is like exactly what you said. The central bank is essentially telling the private sector, look, we're going to stabilize. So bad times, they're not going to be quite as bad as they would have been without us. And good times are not quite going to be as good. And that's what's really, that's the role of the central bank in incentivizing the private sector to really take on more risk. And for the reasons that Stavros mentioned, you know, that helps actually push capital towards those high kind of expected TFP firms, which is kind of like where you want it. I see. But because the capital distribution is sort of then fixed ex post based on investment, uh, you exactly. might waste yeah, less, you, would, you stimulate less once you've tricked them into investing. Well, we haven't allowed the central bank to do that. And we've chatted about that. Um, they would want. And I could talk about that in a minute if you want. But intuitively, what's happening in the model is, right, the capital allocation is predetermined in period T. It's determined in period T minus one. And the central bank's role is all about anticipation effects. Really, what's going on here is we know that if bad times come, the central bank is going to help. And when good times come, they're not going to be quite as good. And it's all those anticipation effects that are you know, causing these reallocations and risk shifting across firms and, and things like this. But I think that's an important point for people to take away, which is this model is really built on anticipation effects of monetary policy, that we all know that this rule is in place and it's going to help us out in bad times and sort of, you know, uh, dampen down good times. Um, but I have two, two questions. First, maybe you can um, answer Tom's point about the, the invariance of these uh, wedges to monetary policy. Obviously, we have, you know, people here worked on the bank channel of monetary policy, right? And so there is presumably uh, the feedback from that into uh, the, uh, the kind of the, the, the bank lending side, uh, we can think of, you know, maybe other things like incentives, right? CEO pay that is tied to firm profitability and that that could also potentially be affected by monetary policy. Um, and the second question kind of related is, can we think of fiscal policy as, well, on the one hand, stabilizing if it's optimal, on the other hand, potentially the source of wedges if we think about corporate taxes varying with not the business cycle, but the political cycle, right? And, and the political cycle kind of being actually pro-cyclical in the sense that, you know, uh, Republicans get elected when the economy is good, they cut corporate taxes and, and vice versa, because you need a pro-cyclical wedge, right? And, and, and the fiscal policy is set optimally, obviously that's, you know, that, that's no good for, for getting getting the mechanism to work. But if it's set in this sort of political economy way, maybe, you know, we have models of, uh, of these sort of tax, taxes that are moving with, with political economy in this counter cyclical sort of way. Um, so have you thought of that? Yeah, so those are great questions. So let me just say something more generally about the wedge and then I can address these two like more particular questions. So we want it to be like as agnostic as kind of possible about the wedge. And it really just enters like any profit tax. And so any interpretation you want to put on that is okay. And I don't, and just to correct one thing, I don't really need a pro-cyclical wedge. I could have a counter-cyclical wedge. It would just have opposite results for what monetary policy should be doing. And I don't really have a stake in this. So if you think agents are taking on too much risk in the economy, inefficiently so, then you would just get the opposite sign on monetary policy, which is like perfectly fine as well. And that would mean like the allocation is too risky in equilibrium, and the central bank can kind of fix that by increasing the amount of aggregate risk, you know? Um, yeah, so I think uh, the kind of fiscal policy tax interpretation is perfectly legitimate. Um, also would help us avoid some of the issues that some of the valid issues that Tom brought up since maybe we'll think about that as not determined by monetary policy. <laughs> so that would be one, one other interpretation. And I'm really open to more interpretations. I mean, we put it in, like I said, in a way that we try to be kind of agnostic and just say, you know, this is sort of a primitive and there could be a lot of different like sources that it stems from. Um, and so, right, that's my answer on the fiscal policy tax and on Tom's points, 
for the two micro foundations we put in the paper, we are completely sympathetic. Those could be influenced also by monetary policy. We just kind of put them as a, in as examples. Um, I think going pushing further on that front would be really useful, but then you sort of, you know, you have to take a strong stand on what the wedge is, right? And you have to come up with data that would let you identify that. And you might think the wedge comes from different sources and you would think about, you know, ways of separating them. I've done work on that kind of topic in other contexts. Um, and I think that would be an extremely useful exercise since we find that the wedge is kind of large as Tom pointed out. Um, and that's something, yeah, we can think about doing in the future for sure. Just to take on that question, so you mentioned fiscal policy, but what about like macro prudential policy? Do we see this role of monetary policy as compensating for the lack of macro prudential policy? Or perhaps given the macro foundations that you, you provided, if you introduce a macro prudential policy as well, would you still have a role for monetary policy to help on this? No, it's a great question. So when we start introducing other policies, and in the paper, we actually look in detail at fiscal policy as well, uh, like labor market income taxes, um, and we look at fiscal and monetary policy together. Um, and for sure, there's other policies that can help with this issue. And in fact, if I put enough policies into the model, you know, I can always get back to the first best. You know? I have two distortions. If I have the right two policies, I can kind of get back to the first best. Um, but yeah, macro prudential policy, if you're thinking like, you know, a tax or subsidy on firm level investment that depends on the firm's betas, you know, that will help for sure. So here we're assuming that, you know, we just don't have that kind of policy in place or access to those kinds of instruments. Um, in the paper, we actually have an interesting result with fiscal policy and people who work in monetary policy models might, might see this. If you allow fiscal policy and monetary, so think about fiscal policy like labor market income taxes um, and monetary policy like I showed you today, if we allow those both to be jointly determined optimally by the two different policy makers, we kind of restore a natural ordering actually where fiscal policy is really targeted towards fixing the allocational problems and monetary policy goes back towards stabilizing inflation and output gap allocation. And so I think in, in, you know, in short, like thinking about other policies um, in this kind of environment and you know, whether they're implementable or not, whether we have them in the real world and how they would interact with monetary policy, you know, I think that would be a pretty fruitful way to go. And we have some results on that in the paper, but we could probably push further on that. All right. Given this is the last talk, uh, maybe we can take more questions. <laughs> more questions? Nobody's, nobody's in a rush to catch a plane. So uh, okay, yeah. if people wanna keep it going, we could, we could, uh, we could talk. I guess a quick question kind of picking up on Stavros's question, which is, you know, there are lots of different ways that uncertainty and risk can affect investment, right? Even if you just think about the basic uncertainty channel, if you have limited liability, firms might swing for the fences and might actually invest more if they, um, if they perceive either more uncertainty or more uh, state space or uh, weighted uncertainty. Do you have a sense how, how you know, how that could work in, in your framework? So just to describe I think you're again, probably like, doing the right direction, but yeah. Just describe for me again what you have in mind exactly. So So what I have in mind is that I guess if I mean more kind of an in entrepreneurship innovation sort of approach to investment where um, you know if you have uncertainty, you uh, you may want to invest more because you you get more from the get more from the downside protection. And then if you have this additional SDF that, you know, weights the worst states of the world more, maybe you value it even more. So you might actually want to invest more in that case. Right, no, that's a great point. So that's actually also going on a bit in the weeds of the algebra of the model. So because these higher beta firms are more volatile, there is a force there for them to want to invest more. But there's really what's interesting and we kind of, um, it turns out to be small, um, it doesn't show up in some approximations, but, um, you know, there it's really important to think differently about the role of uncertainty versus risk. So there, there's a variance term, which is which I'll call uncertainty. And indeed, as you kind of posit, like investment tends to be increasing in that, but the risk is really coming from a covariance. Um, and here we're really focusing on that covariance term. And that's pushing in the other direction and turns out to be like much stronger actually. I mean, there is like, it's kind of interesting, like there is like kind of a long literature and 
on the effects of uncertainty and investment. And I think the results tend to go in different directions. And it turns out like in this class of models, generally you get investment, like you say, increasing in uncertainty, but in our kind of model, it's decreasing in risk. And I wanna make sure that we have a sharp like distinction between those two things. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah. All right. Well, I guess this is probably all, right? No last questions. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, this has been uh, great uh, fun having you all here. Thanks a lot to the discussants. Uh, that really, uh, really appreciate your hard work. Thanks to everyone for your participation. Uh, as I said yesterday, this is my last uh, workshop as president. I'm handing over the reins to Pablo, who is already uh, at the wheel, I guess. Uh, so Pablo Corlot, um, and uh, we have Alexi, Georgia, and uh, Francisco coming on as uh, board members over the course of um, this year. Uh, also, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, our next workshop will be also held virtually on October 22nd, um, by, uh, uh, hosted by uh, Laura at Columbia, co-organized co with Juan Venki. Um, and uh, we are hoping to have our uh, first live workshop uh, after, um, after COVID in the spring of 2022. Uh, Eduardo, I believe you're, you're there. I think Eduardo is going to be hosting it at, uh, at Yale. Uh, is, that, uh, is that still the That's plan? That's the plan. Excellent. Well, uh, again, thanks, uh, thanks everyone. And uh, hope to see you all um, physically at some point. But in the meantime, we'll be, uh, we'll be seeing each other like this uh, on, uh, on Zoom and uh, Facebook Live and subscribe to our YouTube channel as always, if you have not. We are, we are a young society, so we have to keep, you know, show everybody that we are keeping up with the times. Thanks and uh, good luck. Thank Thanks you, everyone guys. for the question. Thank you, Nick. Good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick.